Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 83, I'm going to try to answer the question, what in the heck is a buffer? But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, a tube buffer is a piece of equipment, audio equipment, that's dropped into the audio chain to alter the sound in some way. Let's just talk about tube buffers, since we're really only interested in tubes. And believe it or not, solid state owners will sometimes drop a tube buffer into their systems to improve the sound. Recording studios will do the same thing for the same reasons. So, what is a tube buffer doing? Well, it's bringing the warm, rich tube sound that is filled with lovely second harmonics into the music. Let me grab a sweep of, let me back out a bit here for you, a sweep of the Universal Kit Preamp. Now, this is, this is one of our test sweeps, and we publish these with each and every kit, so you can get an idea of the performance. So th this is the fundamental or the signal up here at zero dB. Notice how it's dead flat. That's because the signal of the actual preamp reproduction, it's dead flat. <laughs> Over here, way down here at about minus 55 dB, we have the second harmonic. It's also quite flat. It's got a very tiny blip. It's hard to see, but it's, it's there at 60 hertz. And um, minus 58 dB is a long way down. It's a huge drop in sound. And below that, we've got the other harmonics. The third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way up to the ninth we've measured. And they're way down here well below minus 80 dB, most of the most of them. Um, and, and this is essentially the noise floor, is way down here. At 120 hertz, typically you're going to see the peak of the noise floor. There's a little tiny blip here. That's very common. You take 60 hertz from the house wall and you rectify it and you're, you're now doubled. So you're at 120 hertz. So it's not surprising that you'll have a little blip around 60 and a little blip around 120. So this is your second harmonic. A harmonic is just essentially, it's easiest to think of it as a mirror of the primary signal. That's really what it is. The, um, the octave that it's in shifts, but let's not get into too much of the details of that. Basically, a harmonic a good harmonic like the second or the fourth, the even harmonics, will fill in the sound. And they'll make the sound sound richer, uh, more full-bodied, um, and it'll give us a lot of what people call tube magic. Okay, enough of the sweeps. Let's get to the drawings. Now, pardon my, my artistic abilities. <laughs> they're, they're non-existent. But sometimes it helps to have some cards. So this is my basic system. I have the, I have a universal kit phono preamp. It's the prototype version. I've got the universal kit preamp that runs the 6 or 12 SN7. We also have an E80CC preamp. But this is the one that's in my system the most because I specialize in the 6SN7 and 12SN7 tube that this plays and I sell a lot of those tubes. So I do a lot of live testing just before I ship tubes to customers. So this preamp is in constant use. I've got my URI kit mono block is in my primary system, and I've got my open baffle speakers. Okay, now I'm just using my system as an example, but we're gonna play shuffle the card in just a minute to make it more interesting. So my system is tube rich. There's lots of tube sound. The tubes, of course, that I choose are wonderful sounding tubes. The kits that I design sound great. The universal 
preamp in particular deliberately has the second harmonic brought up a little bit. We just looked at a sweep of it, of the actual preamp and performance. And that little tiny bit of second harmonic that was deliberately put into the design through filtering, um, I can't tell you any more. Um, that little bit of second harmonic brought this tube amp from something that sounded okay. It just, the prototype sounded okay. <laughs> In fact, Charles and I were doing listening tests and neither one of us wanted to say it, but we didn't want to release it. It just didn't, it didn't have that magic. And then we, we did some adjustments to the, f to the, to the, um, to the filtering of the power supply and we were able to bring that second harmonic up just just enough and wow <laughs> the first time we the first second the first note we heard it was like wow <laughs> we're keeping this design <laughs> we've got a winner okay it's a winner okay so now this is not your typical system but this is many of you are running the wilsonton r8 or some other large class ab integrated tube amplifier now and you probably are just feeding a streaming device into this because integrated amplifiers have preamps and power amps built into the whole package the whole schmo is in here all you need to do is, is send a signal from a cd player or a streaming device or whatever and bob's your uncle you got sound now large class AB amps and almost every tube amp out there that's in existence is a class AB. And the reason for that is you get a lot more power for tube and you can basically drive your power tubes harder in class AB. You get better bass, you get good drive, and you get, you get efficiency. The amplifier topology I prefer is pure class A. And the magic of pure class A is unbe unbeatable, but you, gen you basically have to accept much lower power and less efficiency. So they're not for everyone. And you need an efficient speaker, like the one I'm running, in order to, to play something like the Uri Monoblock. So if you were just running some sort of a streaming device into here, you may be very happy with the sound, but you may think it doesn't quite have the magic of my friend's system that's all tubes. If you sat down in my place and listened to my system, you'd say, huh, I wonder what's missing. Well, what happens in a, in a class AB amplifier is there's a cancellation effect. So a lot of the harmonics that are produced in the tubes, there's nine tubes in this in this integrated amp, a lot of those harmonics are cancelled out in the push-pull design. That gives you low noise and it gives you lots of power, but it also takes away, it literally filters out through topology, through design topology, it filters away a lot of what we like about tube amplifiers. So is all lost? No. Now you can think about a buffer. So we could put the universal pre in front of it. We could even put a tube preamplifier in front of it. And that would bring some tube magic, particularly if we chose the preamplifiers carefully and the tubes we use in them very carefully. Now, what if you had, hang on a second, I gotta find my card. What if you were running, let's say you were running a, a solid state system. So you've got a solid state preamplifier, you've got a solid state integrated or power amp and separate preamp, whatever. And you're really, the sound's just really flat. It's lifeless. Compared to a tube system, it's blah. <laughs> so what can you do? Well, you could do this. You could put a buffer in. You could take, you could drop the universal preamp in ahead of the solid state phono preamp and the signal would go from here, let me get my pointer on it, from here to here to here to here, of course. Now, you might say, Jim, if this is a Class AB um, integrated amplifier or solid state amplifier or tube amplifier, isn't it going to cancel out all the goodness from here? No, it doesn't. 
What happens is the cancellation effect is in the local area of the tubes themselves in the amplifier. So the tubes that are feeding into the class AB circuit suffer the effects of the cancellation. If you drop in a buffer somewhere further down the chain, that whatever the whatever the I was going to say whatever the massage of the sound, it's just a terrible analogy. Whatever is added or subtracted for that matter at this stage, at this interstage or the buffer stage, now is seen by your integrated amplifier as part of the signal chain. Ah, oh, you say, now I understand how buffers add things to the, to the sound or improve, can improve the sound. Now, if you choose a buffer that's noisy, you choose a buffer that you know takes a terrible sounding tube, um, you, you could actually make the sound worse. <laughs> but if you choose carefully, you can really make huge improvements to your overall sound. Okay, hopefully everyone got that. Now, let me just grab the Universal Kit preamp. Let's back out. It's a big boy. Well, it's not that big, I guess. But anyways, now, one thing I want to talk about quickly before we go is the tubes. Now, this is one of my favorite tubes. This is the Tungsol 6SN7 GTB tall boy that I play quite a bit in my Universal. I have some other favorites. I play the Sylvanias a lot as well. And these tubes sound absolutely amazing. They've got w good warmth, not as much as the Sylvania, but they've got good warmth, but they have amazing levels of detail. Detail that goes back into the recording so deep that it almost makes you want to cry. Um, these are the amplifiers. I'm going to keep repeating that for years and years until people start shouting it back at me. The tubes are the amplifiers. So yes, the design topology is important. The build quality is important. But if you put a crappy amplifier inside your preamplifier, then you're going to get crappy sound. So yes, everything depends on the quality of the tubes. And it's why my job is so easy. I get mail back from new customers constantly saying, Jim, wow, I thought I trusted you that you were going to give me something good. But this is like, wow, <laughs> this is like way better than just good. This is amazing. And all I did was supply good testing, quality vintage tubes. That's all. And they were running modern tubes. And trust me, very few modern tubes sound very good. Some do. There are always exceptions to the rule, but the vast majority of them don't. Okay, so what's been happening over at Melatone Kits? Well, our second test builder for the Universal just finished, and he's using it to drive his Wilsonton R8, just like we talked about a few minutes ago. And he's loving it. And I've used the Universal to drive my Wilsonton R8, and it, it makes a huge difference. It's just a great improvement to it. You wouldn't think adding pieces of equipment into your system would. And as a minimalist, I really resist doing that. But when it comes to this particular little trick of audiophiles, it can, it can, it doesn't always, but it can make a huge difference. Anyways, like all of our test builders, um, the second builder came up with a couple of really great suggestions on how to improve the assembly process or how we assemble a couple of areas of the kit. And there, we've already incorporated them. As always, a big shout out to all of our test builders. You guys just rock. Okay, what came in this week? Well, hang on. Let's clear the decks. It's going to take a minute. Okay. And these, and let's zoom in a little bit. Spoiler alert, one of these tubes is not what it what it says it is. Okay. 
and we'll get to it in a minute. So the Toronto assembled Sylvanias, I call them the Rogers Sylvanias, um, commonly are a short bottle. In fact, we're going to look at the Sylvania US assembled 6SN7 GTBs. They're in their normal common form or version. There is a tall boy version, both some made in the US and some made in Canada. And these are wonderful sounding tubes. They have that house, that set, that Sylvania house sound that I love so much, warm and rich with good detail, and they are fairly rare. I've been collecting them for about two years, and I finally have enough to make a listing in the store. Um, they, they're really in that 6SN7 GTB sound of the Sylvania, but I love the sexy uh, look of the tall boys, and there's enough in the store to make up lots of match pairs for the moment, but I probably will never find enough Again, it's just, they're just not that common. I really don't know why they started making some tall boys, whether this was a special order or for a couple of years they did, but tall tubes went out of fashion when the TV came in to being because they, they needed space and big tall tubes really took up space. So tubes got shorter starting in the 1950s when TVs started getting made. Anyways, those are in the store found a whole bunch of these Sylvania rebranded Baldwin. Now Baldwin was a large U.S. organ manufacturer and one of the common tubes that they used in large numbers was the 6SN7 GTB and they also used the smaller 9-pin version, the 12AU7. But of course that's not my favorite tube. This is. <laughs> and these are all um, I, it was a great order. The supplier gave me good high testing tubes. They weren't cheap, but um, it allowed me to restock the, um, the Sylvania 6SN7 GTBs, um, which is a very high demand tube, and it allowed me to restock the Freya sets that I sell, the premium premium sets called USA Platinum. That uses the Tungsol and the Sylvania together. A sort of a tag team. Anyways, those are in the store. I always save the best for last. And finally, after about two years of collecting them, I found enough Svetlana KT88s. Um, they are rare. I'm not sure why. I just I figured that they just didn't produce that many. The 6550C which is a lovely tube in the KT88 family. It's a little lower powered, sounds amazing in the Wilsonton R8, and probably in many other amps, um, was made in large numbers. So they're still fairly commonly available, but not the KT88s. Now, let's see if we can get the logo up. These have the famous Flying C logo, but you've got to be wary. There are a lot of fakes and a lot of reissues out there and they all look the same with a few exceptions. So all the KT88s have metal bases, they have plastic bottoms, the reissues and fakes all look very much like this and they've got reinforcing rods, they all have reinforcing rods and they'll normally have an upper mica. See this? This is a high power tube so it's it's got more structure to support it and it's got the lower mica, now the mid mica, and it's got a third top mica and that helps reduce noise and helps make the whole tube structure a lot more rigid. Now they of course have chrome domes and let's take a look at a, a 6550 reissue or fake. Notice how it's got round punch punched out holes in the plate. All of the fakes and all of the reissues have these round holes, as far as I know. As far as I know, Svetlana never punched round holes. So the true Svetlanas, what we call the St. Petersburg Svetlana, use these rectangular holes in production throughout the entire years of production. But look at this. Have a look at the label. They even put on on this fake tube, 
Svetlana Electric Devices, Inc. 6550C. Anyways, um, I'm not going to say any more about them. I'm, as you know, I'm not very happy about what went on with all these reissues and um, all over the world people have been faking various premium tubes and uh, reissuing various famous tubes. And in my opinion, if those reissues or those guys faking the tube had sent out tubes that sounded as good as the original, then I would have been behind them. <laughs> but the reissues don't sound very good. Almost Some of them, the always exceptions to the rules. So not every reissue sounds crap, but 99% of them do, unfortunately. Okay, if you stayed to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Now, I have flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>